Okay. All right. So today we're going to be talking about an interesting property of high dimensional vectors, random high dimensional vectors, which is that as the dimensionality goes up, the vectors start becoming orthogonal, perpendicular. This is not the case in low dimensions. In low dimensions, take two random vectors, two random unit vectors, they will very likely have a, um, a significant overlap. But as you get, as the dimensionality starts to increase, uh, the vectors will start sh sharing, essentially having less and less in common until eventually they're um, orthogonal. So we're just going to do some back of the envelope calculations to see how that comes about. So um, let's just start with a little picture of a couple of vectors here. So here's a random vector x, random vector y, and this is the angle between them. And we're going to measure um, orthogonality by this angle, or better yet, by the cosine of the angle. And you'll recall that this is just x comma y divided by the length of the two vectors. And what we're going to do, the strategy is basically to pick x and y, such that they're approximately unit vectors, and compute their scalar product. And we'll show that we're going to pick them in such a way that they're not exactly unit vectors, but as dimensionality increases, they will tend to become more and more. So their lengths will tend to towards 1. And we'll see that as their lengths tend towards 1, their, um, their scalar product will tend to 0. So the cosine of uh, theta will tend to 0, which means that the angles are going to be uh, about 90 degrees. Okay, so it's going to happen in two steps. The first step is look at picking vectors that have the right lengths. And then the second step is looking at the dot products. So let's do the first, the first one first. So let me change my pen here. Okay. So let's pick some random vectors that will have, as dimensionality goes up, about unit length. So D is going to be our dimensionality. And we're going to pick a random vector, a random d-dimensional vector, as follows. So x is going to have x1, x2, xd. And all of these elements are going to be picked independently and identically from the distribution, the normal distribution that has mean 0 and variance 1 over d. And the reason why we pick the variance of 1 over d is that, as you'll see, it will mean that the length of this vector will tend towards 1 as dimensionality increases. So let's look at that length um, and see what its mean and standard deviation are. So let's define a variable called L, and that's going to be not the length, but the squared length, which is going to be sum on xi squared. So let's just make sure that's, that's all there. Okay, so now we're going to be interested in the statistics of L. So it's um, mean and a standard deviation. Let's look at the mean. So the mean of L is going to be the sum of uh, the mean of xi squared. And well, it turns out that this is just the same as the variance of xi because these elements have mean zero, so their variance is their squared expectation, the expectation of their squared. And we've just written that the expectation that the variance is one over one over d, so this is going to be of one over d, which is equal to one. So that's very good. On on average, the length will be one. But we also want to know how these the length actually fluctuate, the squared length fluctuate around this value. Um, and so to do that, we need to have a notion of the variance. So let's look at the variance. So the variance of L is going to equal to the expectation of the L squared minus EL squared. And we just saw that the expectation of, the, of L was 1. So this is just going to equal to the expectation of L squared minus 1. So now the game is to figure out what the expectation of L squared is. So let's, let's do that. So the expectation of L squared is going to be the expectation of, so we're going to have to just spell it all out, 
i is equal to 1 to d. I'm going to have to multiply this by itself. So let's say j is equal to 1 to d xi squared. Okay, so now we just expand this out. And we just have to be a bit careful because the xi's, they're going to appear together, of course but sometimes it'll be the same XI happening, occurring together, and the statistics of that will change. So we just need to be careful about that. So we'll actually write it out um, as, as follows. So we'll say sum I is equal to J XI squared times XI squared, so this is actually XI to the fourth, plus sum I does not equal to J XI squared XJ squared. Okay, so expectations are linear, so let's just have a look at, we just spread this out. So, plus um, the sum on i does not equal to j of the expectation of xi squared xj squared. Okay, um, and let's finally, let's just, let's just bring this guy in expectation of xi to the fourth plus sum pi does not equal to j expectation of xi squared. And because the xi's and the xj's when i doesn't equal to j are independent, we can actually just write that, we can just separate that expectation process, just like that. Okay, and when I write here i equals j, I just mean, um, you know, in your head you just go over the indices where the i and j are the same. Okay, so now we're going to deal with, um, with these two parts. Um, now, the expectation of xi to the fourth for a Gaussian um, random variable, uh, xi to the fourth, is going to be three times the variance squared, which is going to be three times one over d squared, which is three over d squared. Okay, so that's, that's the, uh, the, the fourth terms. And how many of them do we have? Well, we have d because i equals j happens d times. So we can conclude that sum i equals j of the expectation of xi to the fourth is d times 3 over d squared, which is 3 over d. Okay, so that, that takes care of the xi to the fourth part. Now let's go on to the next part, which is I does not equal to j. Well, this is even easier, right? Because each one of these expectations, so let's just write them out. These are just the variances, right? And we, we, and we know what that is. So this is going to be equal to sum i does not equal to j of the same, they're just the same variance, so it's going to be 1 over d squared. And the question is, well, how many of them are there? Well, we know that um, i does not equal to j d times d minus one time. So you pick you pick the first one and then you pick the remaining index um, from all, you know, as, as you want, except not matching the first. So this is just going to equal to d times d minus one times one over d squared, which is going to equal to d minus one over d. Terrific. So this means, you know, putting the pieces together, we have that the expectation of L squared is three over D. Um, and I think it's gonna be minus, sorry, plus D minus one over D. And so um, this is going to be two plus D over D. And now remember that to get the variance of L, this was the expectation of L squared minus the L squared, which we know is 2 plus D over D minus uh, 1, oops, minus 1, um, which is then just going to be 2 over D. Great. Okay, so what have we found out? Well, we found out that L which is actually the length squared. So it's not the length, the length squared. It's kind of behaving as um, a number that's one um, plus minus root two over D. Okay, 
that's the L, that's the length squared. So kind of the length is kind of is one plus minus root two over D. Okay, so as the dimensionality goes up, um, this length is gonna get closer and closer uh, to one and fluctuate less and less around it. So the idea is that if we pick vectors in this kind of very simple way, then as dimensionality goes up, they're gonna be kind of very tightly, their length, they're basically gonna be unit vectors, very tightly, um, their length's gonna be very tightly uh, occupying the space around one. Okay, excellent. So, so that takes care of, remember we have the cosine theta. Um, let me actually write it down here. So remember we had cosine of theta is equal to So now we're going to pick our x's and y's in just this way, and we'll know that the cosine of theta will, the, the, the numerator of the cosine of theta will be roughly around one, um, and increasingly close to one as, uh, as the dimensionality increases. Okay, so now let's, so, so let's just, uh, so we've already kind of, let's check that part. Now let's look at this part. Okay, so let's define a new random variable, which is going to be x times y. And what are what is x? X and y are going to be picked exactly the same way as before. So x is going to be x1, da, 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 da. xd, where xi is n01 over d. This was to make sure that it becomes uh, a unit vector. And y is the same. So we pick it in exactly the same way. And yi. Okay, so the lengths of these is going to uh, approach. They're going to be our approximately unit vectors as dimensionality increases. And now we're going to be interested in what their scalar product is going to behave like. Okay, so expectation of z. So this is going to be the expectation of sum i equals 1 to d of xi, yi. Um, so we can take the expectation on the inside. And because we've picked xi and yi independently of each other, well, we can just um, distribute the expectation over them. So this is the expectation of xi, expectation of yi, okay? Which, look over here, expectations are zero. So this expectation is gonna be the sum on zero times zero, which is zero. Okay, so on average, you're not gonna overlap, and, and that's not surprising in, in any dimension at all. It's also the case in two dimensions. You know, there's no reason for the overlap to be um, any more positive than it is negative, and, and so on average, it'll, the expectation will be zero. But what we care about is how tightly it's focused around, uh, around zero. So let's compute the variance, the variance of z. So that's gonna be equal to the expectation of z squared minus the expectation of z squared. And we just saw that this was zero, so that disappears. And it's now just the expectation of z squared. Okay, so now what is this? Well, let's expand it out. The expectation of the sum on i equals 1 to d of xi times yi. And then again, let's say j equals 1 to d of xj, yj. Very good. So now let's, let's um, expand this out again. So there's going to be the expectation, and we have to again be careful for the cases where the i's equal the j's. So let's just do that. So there's going to be expectation one to d. Let's do the case where the i's and the j's match. So this is going to be xi, yi, xi again, yi again, and there's d cases when that happens. And then there's going to be, let's just write it down here, plus, you know, i, j does not equal to i, x i, y i, x j, y j. Okay? So now um, let's multiply together the, the i's that, that actually match, and we'll get that this is equal to the expectation on sum on i equals 1 to d of x i squared, y i squared, plus the expectation of the second term where are the i's and j's don't match. 
So we've got sum on i, j does not equal to i of x i, y i, x j, y j. Okay, so now, um, so now something good happens for this second set. So we've got that x i and y i, they were just picked independently of each other. So we can deal with them separately. But x i and x j were also picked independently of each other. And so were y i and y j. So all these terms here are independent of each other. So I'm just going to write this over here as the sum on i j does not equal to i of well actually let me let me let me write it down i'm afraid of going over the the, the side of the page so let's write let's just deal with this first part this the second part so here is the expectation on sum i j does not equal to i of x i y i x j y j and now because of all that independent stuff, we can bring the expectation in, but then distribute it over the terms. So it's going to be the expectation of xi, uh, expectation of yi, expectation of xj, the expectation of yj. And all of those, they're all picked from centered normal distributions. That means, that means their means are zero. So all of those disappear. And so this means that this whole term disappears this is zero. So this whole term becomes zero. Okay, that's really nice. So now we just have to deal with, uh, with the, the terms where the i's and j's matched up. So we've got this whole thing just becomes x i squared times y i squared. That's, that's what we had. And remember the, the i's, the y's and x's are independent. So when we bring the expectation in, again, we can distribute it. So this is going to be the expectation of x i squared, the expectation of y i squared. Okay, and as we saw before, well, these expectations that's they're just the same as the variances, right? Because the means of x i and y i are zero. So this is just sum i equals one to d of variance of x i, variance of y i. Okay, and those variances, what were they? They were both one over d. So we've got sum i is equal to 1 to d of 1 over d times 1 over d, which is all just 1 over d. Very good. So we've got the variance now. So, so we've got that um, z, z, which is equal to x scalar product with y, and just write it like this, is approximately going to equal to 0 plus minus root 1 over d. So we have a quantity here, the scalar product, that you know, as, as d goes to infinity, it's getting tighter and tighter um, around zero. So now we can, then, we can then just go back and look at what our cosine theta looks like, which is, you know, is x, y, um, and here is, you know, x, y. So now we've got, you know, at the bottom we have, and we're, you know, we're playing a little bit, uh, you know, kind of back of the envelope here. But we've got a term, so these were, this is going to be the square root of L, the square root of L here, and this is Z. And we've got that this is, you know, equal to, let's just write like that, of a term that's, you know, plus minus root 1 over D on top. And on the bottom we had root of 1, you know, plus minus root 2 over D, times root of 1 plus minus root 2 over d. And so it's clear that as the dimensions, you know, as the dimension increases, um, the bottom is going to approach 1 uh, closer and closer, while the top gets tighter and tighter around 0. So this thing is going to go to 0 as d goes to infinity. So that was just a, you know, back of the envelope calculation to, to show you that you know as you know that random vectors random unit-ish vectors in high dimensions um, will tend to become orthogonal perpendicular as the dimensionality increases so i hope that was interesting and i hope you learned something and um, if you have any comments please let me know thank you